Welcome to a summary of ethical theories and major moral principles. This is just simply a summary of what we've discussed all semester long. I'm Katie Borkman, your instructor. You'll recall that we started talking a little bit about utilitarianism. And actually, I have to say, we went into some detail. Pictured before you are Jeremy Bentham and John Stuart Mill. Jeremy Bentham, of course, was the originator of the idea that we should be able to quantify pleasure. And he originated something called the hedonic calculus. His follower and disciple, John Stuart Mill, actually addressed some important flaws in the original version that Jeremy Bentham provided. John Stuart Mill thought that it uh, wasn't simply pleasure, but rather other things, such as, for example, accomplishment, and that there were certain kinds of pleasures that we can get out of intellectual undertakings as opposed to just merely sensate pleasure of the kind that uh, perhaps Jeremy Bentham would have uh, preferred to talk about. In either case, utilitarianism is about consequences, so consequently, utilitarianism falls under the general category of consequentialism. The thing to remember about utilitarianism is that an action is good if it produces the greatest good for the greatest number. Sometimes it's a little bit difficult to determine what the greatest good will be for the greatest number, and that is certainly one of the several criticisms that can be launched against utilitarianism in general. But the truth of the matter is, probably every single day, we are, at one time or another, all utilitarians, particularly when we're trying to calculate exactly what the results are going to be on the basis of a decision, a policy, or some other sort of goal that we're attempting to pursue, such as, for example, going to school. What are you attempting to accomplish by going to school? Do you not want to realize the greatest good, at least for you? Now, probably you're thinking also of your family and your friends, and so perhaps you're thinking, do you want to realize the greatest good for the greatest number of people that are involved consequentially in the decision that you're about ready to make and undertake? If a country is fighting a war, in all likelihood, it is also thinking collectively about utilitarian consequences. By contrast, we discussed Mr. Immanuel Kant, pictured here, and deontology. Deontological theories are ethics of duty and obligation. Kant believed that there was a single principle that could be utilized called the categorical imperative. And once we develop a categorical imperative, we also, as a consequence, develop a universal maxim. There are certain tests that Kant required uh, in order to ascertain whether or not a maxim was appropriate. One of them we just mentioned was universality. The other is uh, the idea that we should treat persons as an end not as a means to somebody else's end. So it's extremely important to get an idea about what an end is in this particular situation because what the concept of end, according to Kant, does is capitalize on the notion of autonomy. Autonomy, as you know, means to be self-ruled or self-directed. Kant thought that autonomy was probably of maximal importance, perhaps infinite importance, when we're talking about how to treat persons. A question, of course, that you want to ask yourself is, what counts as a person? Is anything that is human a person automatically? Does person, as a concept, have several necessary and sufficient conditions that are required, minimally at least, in order that we can say that someone or something is a person? The something part we can concentrate on. Perhaps your dog, your cat, your bird, perhaps animals out in the wilderness uh, are minimal persons in some sense. If so, it may be that we can extend the concept of deontology to include them as well, as some animal rights theorists argue. We have discussed briefly a version of contemporary deontology with respect to the great philosopher W.D. Ross of the 20th century. Deontology in general, as Kant expressed it, was a objective and to some extent absolutistic theory. When you think about the deontological maxims and categorical imperatives, it's probably easy to remember 
something that we have uh, grown to understand as the quote-unquote golden rule. For Kant, think about the golden rule stripped of any reference to religion, God, divinity, or scripture. Think about, for example, a maxim such as do not steal or do not lie. Those are classic cases of deontological maxims. Of course, Kant thought that they were uh, not to be overridden. So the basic maxim, do not lie, should apply in all cases in every single circumstance. So it appears as though Kant was what we call a rule deontologist. W.D. Ross, pictured here, comes along and says, well, perhaps we have some uh, ranking that we have to consider. Perhaps it's not always the case that lying is absolutely something that we must feel that we have a duty to do, because in some circumstances, lying might be morally appropriate. As in the case, for example, of not giving away the location of your platoon if you happen to be caught behind enemy lines. That's only one of many examples. Ross came up with the idea of prima facie duties, such as, for example, non-maleficence, which means do no harm. Beneficence, do good. Justice, treat equals equally, which is to say all human beings born equally should be treated equal. Put some autonomy in there from Kant and you have the respect for individuals as well. W.D. Ross argued that these principles are fundamental and uh, of course if you think about medical ethics for example you will probably find these principles fairly widespread there. But consider now in your daily life how you would apply these things and whether or not you'd always apply them in every single case. Of course, you want to be non-maleficent, but there may be some times that, out of self-defense, you might have to harm somebody who's attempting to oppress or offend you, and on and on. You can think about uh, manners in which these things appear to be prima facie at first value, the kinds of duties that we should feel obligated to try to enforce and abide by. But unlike what Kant would say, some of these are uh, can be overridden based upon circumstances and based, of course, upon the prominence and a relationship that you might have in a specific circumstance to other duties. Third major ethical orientation is that of Greek ethics, or Ataic ethics, pictured here, of course, is Aristotle, and we call it virtue theory. A virtue is an excellence, a desirable moral quality, a quality that Aristotle at least thought is possessed only by human beings as rational entities. Animals, such as dogs and cats and lions and giraffes, can't really exhibit virtue, although you have to admit, when you do examine the behavior of creatures like wolves, whales, dolphins, and others, it does seem as though there is a bit of virtue that can be seen to be expressed in their behavior and their interactions with each other. Virtues can often be described by certain social roles, such as, for example, how a parent should behave, how a child should behave with respect to a parent, a spouse, a teacher. Aristotle would have said that these people ideally can become role models. And so in a sense, what they are doing is acting out a kind of virtuous script, and that virtuous script should be observable by all. These role models should be the kinds of beings that ch young children are exposed to as they're growing up in order to help them understand and practice the basic virtues. You'll recall we discussed in our course a main virtue called courage. And on Aristotle's view, courage is a mean between two extremes. The two extremes he would call vices. One is a vice of deficiency, such as cowardliness. The other is a vice of excess, such as foolhardiness. Could be that you know some people who uh, participate in uh, certain kinds of war movies and uh, in some instances they look like renegades or vigilantes perhaps taking on entire armies with their own personal arsenal. While these people probably have been something that is remotely uh, looks like courage, Aristotle would probably say it's an excess and thus therefore a vice. So if you think about vi uh, virtues as striking down the middle path of the golden mean where the associated vices are either deficiencies or extremes, then you have a pretty good idea, essentially, uh, in a summary form of what Aristotle is talking about. You want to think about what qualities make for something which is good. If 
if I think uh, of as Aristotle might have done, what makes a good horse? Well, uh, a good horse is a horse that probably gallops well. A good horse is a horse that is stable. A good horse is a horse, certainly in warfare, that is fast and agile. How about with respect to something that Aristotle did talk about a lot in the Nicomachean Ethics? What makes a good human being? Well, the thing that separates human beings from the rest of the animal kingdom is rationality. A human being is homo sapiens. That almost literally means rational being. And it is our rationality that distinguishes us from other creatures, and hence it is that which we should exercise to the fullest capacity possible. And in so doing, what we do is we become good thinkers. So the province of human beings is to think. Thinking well means that we're doing even a better job at it. And that's exactly the kind of thing that Aristotle would promote for us to do. Think about what it means to be a good physician. Think about what it might mean to be a good patient in this particular context, or a good student, or a good parent. This is just simply a review now of ethical theories with respect to what we just discussed with regard to deontology and virtue. Deontology focuses on rules. Aristotelian, Aristotelian virtue ethics focuses on character. Now, if you add some additional duties to Ross's interpretation of Kant, you've got fidelity, gratitude, and self-improvement. And it's the self-improvement part that tends to resemble what Aristotle was talking about. But remember, Aristotle's thinking on how it is that we can become virtuous is somewhat more organic. Aristotle isn't so much into following rules like the utilitarian would be or the deontologist would be. Aristotle believes that we should build better people. And so it is a rational process that he is promoting. But at the same time, it is not one of those ponderous uh, situations in which we are constantly deliberating about what the right or wrong thing is to do or not to do. We can now add a little bit of uh, someone like St. Thomas Aquinas, and uh, in so doing we can talk about natural law. Natural law theories that ultimately come from uh, the Stoics, and to some extent Aristotle, uh, suggest that there are certain natural tendencies or purposes that exist in all things, including human beings, of course. That which is considered to be natural is what is to be followed. So the idea, of course, would be that if you pick out what is natural based upon your observations, then it should follow that you can divine, so to speak, a principle by means of which you can conduct your affairs. They become principles of conduct. Also, a natural organic goal is that which is presumably to be achieved. One of the classic images of this, as a kind of a metaphor, is an acorn. An acorn grows into an oak. In a sense, that's the end. That's the goal that is supposed to be achieved. That is its teleological objective. If you apply similar reasoning, according to natural law theorists, to the human condition, then human beings should become that which they are destined, so to speak, genetically or otherwise, to become, and the behaviors and activities that they engage in should lead, ultimately, to the fruition of what it means to be a human being. Think about it. Is there a natural tendency of things to continue to their, their existence? This kind of thinking, of course, gets applied to concepts such as, which are highly controversial, obviously, and not going to be solved by simply an appeal to natural rights, abortion, contraception, embryonic and fetal research, etc. So the argument would go, is it natural to abort a fetus given that it has a natural tendency to continue its existence? Clearly you can see, and there's no room for discussion here at this point in time since this is just simply a summary overview, that you could go on to discuss many of these things and no doubt provide many counter instances to any of the theories proposed here, particularly natural law theory. Now that it is the end of the semester, thank you for joining me. It's been a real joy and a real pleasure being your instructor. Thank you very much.